Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about how you can create digital assets and how to use them. So in previous video, I already talked a bit about a quick introduction, what they are and how you can build them. But I also want to give you a more detailed look on how you should make them and how to make parameters and so on. So the next couple of videos will go a bit more in depth on how to make certain tools, parameters and things like that. So here we're going to start out with the fence tool and we're going to slowly improve this tool and we're going to add more and more features so we have a nice custom interface at the end. So here I have a demo setup for a fence tool. So this is my fence currently. It's nothing super special, but over the next videos we will improve and we will actually have something that looks pretty good. So here we have actually three main parts as you can see here from this merge node. So I have this pillar here on the side, then I have my planks and the planks are done by placing a line here in my scene. And on this line, I have specifically placed points. So in the parameter, we can have number of points here. So 10 and on each point, we're going to copy a box. So here we have that box. We do a bevel. I'm going to do centering with the matching of the size. So it's actually nice on my grid. If I look at my grid, it's nicely placed on there. And then I have this result. And then the last part here is then these wooden beams at the back for structure. So again, making a box, doing a bevel, and I'm using a duplicate to copy that over here as well. So this is then my result of the fence. This will be my starting geometry or starting setup. So to make a digital asset, there are a few ways, but most commonly what we will do is we're going to select everything we have here available. We're going to go to assets and we're going to say make digital asset from selection. So now we have this menu and we can type in a name for our tool. So since we're going to make a procedural fence, let's call this procedural fence tool. Again, this will automatically be saved under my documents under the OTL folder. And here it will call procedural fence tool. So let's press accept. And this menu should pop up where we will be able to create parameter interfaces. So this menu is very important and you will probably use this multiple times. So here we have our basic settings. So like the naming, certain icons, versions, in and outputs we have. Then the next step is talking about our parameters. So I will use this in a second where I'm going to create a couple parameters. Then we have the node section where we can have guide geometry, editable nodes, messages, and other things that are available. Then we have our inputs, which is basically naming certain inputs for the node. Then we have our help. We have some more code, scripts, interactive menus. We can add certain specific viewer states, custom handles, and other things. We can add some extra files. So we can add some Python in here, and we also have some safe options. So these are some of the tabs you have here. Most of the time, you will be working in the first two, where we're going to create our parameters. And here, if you ever want to change inputs or the name, you will be able to work in these two menus most of the time. So if we now would press accept, the menu would close and we still have here our note. So now it's actually procedural fence. So if I now dive in here, we still have our setup. One of the first thing I would already recommend doing is actually placing a output note. The output note is just to make sure that this is always my output geometry. So if I would not use the output note and put my render tag on this part, you will see that I'm only outputting that geometry. So once we have set this up, let's talk about now creating parameters. So before I create parameters, let's think about some parameters I want to show you already that we could do. So since I've used this line and I'm going to copy boxes on the points, if I change the number of points of my line, I will also influence how many boxes I copy. So this is an interesting parameter to have available in my menu. So that's already one parameter I can quickly implement. So we're going to go here to our assets and we're going to go to add asset properties and open our procedural fence. 
you have to make sure you are inside your tool. If I'm, for example, not in my tool and go to properties, then we don't have any entries. So we're going to have to make sure you're either selecting or you're actually inside and editing the tool. So again, edit properties, and we open that menu again, back again here. So I'm going to put this on the side here. And the quick way to actually add parameters is to grab here the values. So you can either grab the number or this naming here, and you can all the way drag this into the parameter folder. So this is my first parameter. So if I would now press apply, it will keep the menu. And we can also see here this green color, and that means that our value is linked to our tool. Now let's check out our value here. So normally if I go to my tool, we should have this value or this slider, which is called points with the value eight. So if I now also show my scene here, if I would now increase this or lower this, we would now have the result as I expected. Now let's change a couple things here. So the naming itself is not super clear for us. So we have two names here. So we have the name and the label. So if you want to change the name that is here in the menu, this is actually the label. So if I would now type in amount blanks, and press apply, you will see that now it's called amount planks. Now the name here itself is actually something that is used a bit more in the background where we actually has this unique name. So the label can actually be used multiple times if you have other parameters, but the name is a unique name for this specific parameter. So that's something special. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about that in a sec, but I also want to show you here that we can also affect the range. So you noticed here that I can go pretty high with my value and I have too much blanks for my line. So we can say that we have, can only have a maximum of, for example, 20. So here with the range, we can go from zero to 20 points. So now if I go back to that slider and if I move it, we can go from zero to 20. So this way we can customize the range here. So let's talk a bit about the name here, which is called points. So if I go back into my tool and now I have my linked value. So we have then the green value. And if I click on points, you will actually see what is actually going on. So this line here is basically setting up a reference to this parameter. So we're going to use CH or channel and we're going to make sure we're going to reference the point value. So the way the channel referencing works is we're going to have to type dot dot slash and that means that we need to go up one more network. So here I'm inside my tool and I need to go one, up one more network so we can actually here get that value. So we're going to make sure we're going to ask the number of points, which is of course referencing to this. So if I would now type in here, um, also a amount of blanks, for example. So if I would press apply, it will automatically also change that name here as well. So again, we are directly getting a reference from our tool in here. So if I need to have this value here somewhere else, I could, for example, copy paste this. And if I want to, for example, use this to automatically scale the planks here. So if I would go to this box and if I would play around with this scale, so I could, for example, paste this in here and now I have a large value. So we're going to probably have to say, I'm going to grab this channel and I'm going to divide it by, for example, 10 or something else. So we can say divide by 10. And now we have this result. So again, if you want to see the actual value, click on the number, the name here. So now we see that the value is 0.8. So if I'm now, say, maybe divide by a bit more, like 15, we now have blanks like this. 
So now it automatically will scale the planks based on the point numbers. So if I go back here to geometry, to my tool, and if I increase this, you should see that our planks should also have change in scale. So we can see that the smaller my value is, the smaller the planks will be, and the higher my value, the higher the planks also will be. So it's kind of working a bit reverse now. So let's say I'm not happy with what I did here and I would like this to be a normal value back again. So we can type in here a value so I can override this. So we can say 0.5, for example. But what we notice is that there is still a green color here. So there is actually nothing linked anymore because if I click here on the name here, we can see that the channel is gone. If you want to get rid of the green color, which I think would be a good idea, is to right click and we're going to say delete the channel. And now it's gone of that color. So just for structure, it's always good to know that a green color is used for referencing or using it in a tool. So that was a bit about creating our first parameter. And let's go back to our tool here. And I want to talk a bit about uh, digital assets itself. So now we have our digital assets. And every time I would now use my tab menu and type in fence tool, we see here now our fence tool. So I can click this and I can place this in my scene. So again, I have the same tool here with the same slider. And of course, this can have a different value than this one. So they are not specifically linked with the same sliders value, but they are linked with the same logic. So I can now, for example, create a variation. So now I can create a variation with higher plank density. And what is special here to notice is the lock icon. So this one is open. So this one is editable and this one is closed. So this is not editable. So if I jump in here, double click, we can see that this is all grayed out. So this means I cannot go in here and start playing around with sliders. As you can see, the menu is grayed out I, and I won't be able to go grab the sliders. So the reason why this is, is because this is directly linked or referenced to the procedural fence tool. So for example, if I would now change my network and place, for example, a color node. So let's make the fence for example, a brownish color, like so. So my fence is now this color. So currently, if I look at my fence, it has this brown color, this one has not. But if I start saving this tool, so we can go to assets, we can go here, just save. And if I now look at my other fence here, it also now has that color. So we save the tool into our local library and then this one just always reference that tool. So it's always a good idea. Let's say if you have a setup where you generate like five different fences, so we can just copy this node like multiple times. We can then of course change the values. It's always a good idea to leave them locked. So they always keep referencing our original tool. If I'm going to lock or open each tool, they are all separated from each other. And this can might be quite confusing uh, later on. So what you do if you maybe are done with your tool, let's say I want to now close my tool or close the lock. We're going to right click on it and we're going to say match the current definition. So it's going to look at your library and it's going to try to match that what is stored or that node information that is stored in your library. So if I made any tweaks here and did not press save, they will probably be gone. So let's right click and say match definition. So now the lock is closed and they are all closed as you could see. So if I, for example, then want to open this back up again, so I can now, since they are all locked, I can choose any of them. And I can just right click and we can say allow editing of content and the lock will open. And now I can start building my tool up again.
So I can, for example, now delete the scholar back again, press save, and we will see that everyone has the call removed. The main point that I want to make here is to always have only one node that has been editable or unlocked and the other nodes you have of that tool should be locked so they always reference this one the one that is being editable so that's very important because again if you're gonna work and make every single edit note for example i can start making this editable i can start making this one editable as well these three notes here they are not referenced to each other anymore like they are basically separate but as soon as i for example would select one and press save i'm going to override certain values so as example here again i can for example dive in here i can place the color note i can now for example add maybe a bluish color and if i now would save this so I'm going to save this now to my library and I can see that everyone that has been locked has the blue color and the notes that have been unlocked don't have the blue color because they are editable and they are not directly linked anymore to my tool. So again, you're going to have to make sure that most of them are matched definition or locked. That's a bit about how you should use or manage your tools a bit to make sure you are locking and unlocking the right assets. And that was it that I wanted to talk about this video. I hope you watch the next ones. Thanks for watching.